right. So hi, everybody. I'm just briefly going to take over the screen here to introduce you to our panel on magic, uh, celebrity, and industry. We have uh, four amazing papers that we're going to be presenting. Um, and we're thinking it's going to be about 20 minutes per paper, and that will leave us a nice uh, healthy, like 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. Um, so if, you know, if you finish a little early, that's great. That means we get extra time for questions. Um, my name is Megan Condis. I am an assistant professor at Texas Tech. And our first speaker is Jack Murray, who is at the University of Central Florida. And he's going to be talking to us about additional casting costs, how Magic the Gathering Arena perfected the ludic economy. So let me just pin Jack and unpin myself. And thank you so much. Take it away. All right. Hi, thank you, Megan. Um, I'm Jack Murray. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate uh, in the text and technology program at uh, UCF. Um, my talk today is uh, about the relationship between analog games and uh, the so-called ludic economy, um, where I'm interested in the historical trajectory of uh, kind of systems of monetization and the way capital flows through um, games and where they came from and how they've been refined. Um, so kind of the, the main point is that a lot of these systems are not new, uh, but instead have been present in analog gaming spaces um, and have even primed players for their introduction into digital games and at an even uh, broader point have kind of primed people for uh, things like blockchain and uh, uh, NFTs and whatnot. Um, so I'm going to uh, kind of go through um, a few a few of these things, and specifically the argument that I'm trying to make is that these systems uh, are already present in Magic the Gathering, and then Arena as an adaptation of Magic uh, not only recreates these systems, uh, but then kind of perfects them in uh, the wake of uh, more contemporary monetization schemes. Um, so a brief overview of what the ludic economy actually is. Um, it's a term I'm pulling from um, Seth Giddings and Allison Harvey, uh, who in a special issue identify uh, the ludic economy as a dynamic ecosystem of emergent business models new models of production and labor, and new cultures of play that are intertwined with the entertainment and uh, in, uh, entertainment industrial complex of, of late capitalism. Um, so this emerges in uh, many forms, uh, but for the sake of scope, um, I'm just kind of uh, going to lump a few together and uh, um, go over some of them. So the uh, kind of order we have um, digital scarcity, uh, gamblification, uh, battle pass capitalism, um, and then kind of veering over into some modes of fan production um, as they work under this uh, under these systems and then uh, kind of anxiety surrounding ownership. So um, gamblification is uh, a process where digital games are increasingly drawing on modes of, of uh, that we recognize from gambling. Uh, in order to drive uh, consumption within their uh, within their platforms, um, gamification differs from gambling uh, primarily because uh, in that it describes uh, it describes forms of gambling that are ancillary to the primary experiences of play. So things like um, uh, loot boxes, um, gotcha games. Uh, you know these kinds of systems, but even things like skin gambling and esports, um, and uh, and other kinds of uh, of betting that is uh, that happens alongside it. These things have been uh, the focus of uh, government and government regulation, consumer skepticism, um, and provides a way for players to receive uh, in-game items, uh, usually cosmetic, uh, sometimes new characters, uh, sometimes a form of digital currency, which can then be used to purchase items in, uh, in games. Uh, these systems generally rely on uh, artificially induced scarcity, where the rarity of an item is determined by how valuable it is speculated to be for the players. Um, whether that's, hey, this thing looks cool and we put more effort into it, so let's make it rarer so people spend more money to get it. Uh, mechanically, which is, hey, this is a very powerful item, let's uh, 
uh, for both balancing reasons and uh, for you know to encourage people to continue buying packs and get, uh, you know taking chances on getting this thing um, or some other uh, other metric that emerges. Um, so as with uh, other kinds of collectibles before uh, uh, sales of magic cards uh, predominantly occur through um, purchasing booster packs which contain a pre uh, predetermined distribution of card rarities um, that is uh, determined mathematically based on its perceived power level during the design and development period and the more powerful a card the higher its rarity the lower its chance of appearing in a booster pack this is a balancing mechanism and also an incentive to keep buying into the system uh, the odds of getting the cards you want let alone multiple copies uh, that you might need for competitive play are incredibly low um, and so this is reflected in the uh, like relatively recent introduction of things like loot boxes um, and gacha mechanics in digital games um, which have uh, uh, which as I mentioned earlier have come under some scrutiny but the same scrutiny has been largely avoided by uh, Magic the Gathering and other trading card games despite post-dating these digital implementations which share both the material and uh, an effective construction. And part of this I believe can be attributed to the tension between physical and digital ownership um, where there's an anxiety uh, which plagues the game industry um, as digital distribution becomes more common um, and people start uh, like to ask what does it mean to own a digital item. Um, and so, uh, so as I kind of gestured to before, um, this uh, really kind of primes people for things like uh, non-fungible tokens and like uh, crypto related um, like mechanisms for like verifying digital ownership. But I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so the next kind of system we have is uh, what Daniel Joseph describes as battle pass capitalism, which is a way that many free to play games or games with long lifespans uh, due to their primarily multiplayer nature, encourage um, players to regularly pump money into uh, into a game. These battle passes and event passes uh, generally lock uh, content behind purchasing uh, purchasing access, um, which resets on a seasonal basis. And players earn rewards from the battle pass by playing the game, completing challenges, or participating in other related activities. And often these are not necessarily required for access for a lot of the gameplay, uh, but instead re reward players uh, for playing with uh, additional in-game items. Um, uh, sometimes uh, there's content that's locked behind, uh, locked behind these passes. Uh, while it's not a one-to-one -one translation, I find that this is similar to uh, the kind of rotating standard format that um, uh, Magic the Gathering uses. So the standard format, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is a format where players construct a 60-card deck comprised of uh, the legal cards from the eight most recent sets. Um, and this is uh, like a way that you're required to uh, build your decks uh, to, in order to play in officially sanctioned formats. So this is a kind of pay-to-play um, combined with like the gamble of buying boosters uh, which can cause playing Paper Magic to be expensive. Um, this uh, expense, however, is, is mitigated um, uh, by the emergence of uh, secondary markets. Um, so secondary markets are embedded in uh, platforms as a way to exchange uh, in-game uh, in items. Sometimes this is an in-game auction house like we might see in an MMO, um, or real money trading through uh, something like Steam's Marketplace. Um, uh, in you know Paper Magic, there are uh, entire stores that are supported primarily based on buying and selling single cards, um, and allows players to uh, uh, and allows players to have a way to either cash out or uh, kind of mitigate the cost of playing. But this is stuff that um, escapes Wizards of the Coast, uh, you know, kind of ecosystem. So like generally they're not getting money from like selling single cards but they do get money for people buying the packs which then turn uh, turn around and uh, fill the secondary market um, 
Additionally, there's an entire segment uh, of the uh, Magic the Gathering industry that's entirely based on accessorizing and augmenting the play experience, where players buy card sleeves to protect their cards, um, and this makes the play experience more streamlined, but also it's an opportunity to show off a bit of personality through the use of color pa uh, colors, patterns, images, and custom designs. Um, and the same thing goes for uh, card sleeves, deck boxes, dice that you might need, uh, play mats, um, etc. Um, and then the next thing I want to set up is this idea of uh, fan, uh, fan labor within Magic the Gathering, which um, uh, specifically I want to gesture towards um, things like card altars and proxies, um, which are a kind of way that um, Magic cards get modified uh, for, you know, aesthetic reasons. Um, as well as, as financial reasons. So um, altered cards, uh, which if you look at the Soul Ring example on the PowerPoint, um, is an example of a, uh, an official magic card that has been altered by an artist and then, um, you know, they sell to a player. Um, and then uh, these other two examples are uh, proxy cards, which are like ba essentially fake magic cards um, that look uh, that take the place of like more expensive cards uh, that you might otherwise not like want to play if you don't need it for official play um, and you can also get some uh, interesting customization with this um, which is great because then you get force of will as the the drake meme um, so the reason that i like want to draw attention to this is because the key to my argument is looking at the way capital flows through the mtg ecosystem um, and traditionally, uh, Magic's production of capitals predicated on like the artificial scarcity and rarity of cards, um, and the limitations on how they can and can't be used, as well as uh, like encouraging these secondary marketplaces, which uh, ultimately bolster like overall uh, like the overall flow of capital within the ecosystem. Right. So, um, when I say that uh, Arena has um, perfected this. Uh, kind of ludic economy it, um, is because it's completely co-opted these secondary markets. It's co-opted fan labor production and doubled down on both um, like this idea of battle pass capitalism uh, and this pay-to-play format and also uh, random chance loot crates um, which it sells as booster packs while simultaneously sidestepping any regard for what it means to own cards in Arena. Um, and specifically, Arena's implementation demonstrates how the ludic economy of digital games streamlines um, the extraction of capital and traps it within uh, Wizards of the Coast's Arena ecosystem. Um, so there are three things that I kind of want to point out um, within uh, uh, point out within the um, Arena app. Um, and so first is um, collecting. Uh, like how the collection and card ownership appears. So um, on this uh, screen you can see uh, on the top left is uh, the like collection of cards where it shows you all the cards you own. You can only get these cards from packs, uh, daily challenge rewards, um, and crafting cards using uh, another kind of in-game currency called wild cards. Um, in order to buy cards from packs, you either need to play the game to earn, uh, you know, the free currency, or you can um, buy the premium currency. Uh, but you're still taking a gamble on uh, on what cards you what cards you need. Uh, additionally, collect um, collections can only have up to four of a card, so any like surplus versions of a card you have, in, uh, instead of um, are, are you know it kind of offsets by becoming uh, these wild cards, um, which you can then use to craft um, specific cards that you want. But there's some questions about the, uh, the uh, value of the trade-off between um, like rare card, rare and powerful cards and uh, rare and powerful cards and the, I'm just losing my words, uh, and the value of the wild cards. Um, additionally, unlike uh, Paper Magic or even Magic the Gathering Online, um, there's no way to cash out. You can't trade your cards with other players, um, which means there's no secondary, uh, no kind of secondary player-to-player -player market. Um, the other uh, thing 
um, that I want to point out through this uh, store is um, these kind of cosmetic uh, items, um, which are, uh, you know, in Paper Magic are entirely based off of third party, um, either artists creating cards or selling proxies, um, or, uh, you know, these uh, companies that are making sleeves and whatnot. And so this is something that Arena subsumes and kind of puts into uh, and uh, like recaptures the the money flowing through this part of the industry within uh, Arena's platform. Um, and then oh, that is uh, and then the last thing I want to kind of point out is the uh, uh, formats. Um, so formats uh, have long been a way of like make uh, players continually getting value out of the cards they own um, by coming up with other ways to play the game. So that's how you get things like um, the popper format, where cards have to be under a certain amount, or the commander format, um, where you can only have one of uh, cards, or even formats such as uh, modern, legacy, and pioneer, which are formats that are specifically built around playing with old cards, so you don't have to keep up with standard. Um, but what happens in Arena is it limits you to the limits you to uh, the ways that Wizards of the Coast has decided are like allowable ways to play within the Arena platform. Um, so, a, uh, a kind of um, few like closing uh, things I want to mention is uh, that. Um, like ownership becomes a thing that uh, becomes a thing that arena doesn't really care about because it does uh, because it wants to keep you know the flows of capital within the, within this ecosystem, um, which is why uh, things like NFTs are all, we're always going to fail because companies and platforms don't necessarily want you to be able to cash out of their platforms and um, arena gives you. Uh, you know, gives us a model for like a way that this has become streamlined and a way it has subsumed all the different ways the capital flows through a community, uh, specifically gaming communities. Um, and uh, because it's an adaptation of uh, an analog game, Arena uh, uses these uh, uses these familiar elements to um, make its kind of, uh, operation and transactions legible to the player base. Um, and so uh, this is just kind of an overview of some uh, research I've been doing and, and I've been working on, um, uh, you know, gearing up for my, uh, for my dissertation. Um, so, uh, and like, you know, a curiosity of like, where do these forms of monetization come from? Um, and looking at the way that things like Magic the Gathering um, and Analog Games in General has primed audiences for this kind of uh, this kind of exploitation and this kind of uh, relationship to publishers and uh, and whatnot. Um, yeah, so that's uh, the general gist of it. Um, thank you all, um, and I look forward to discussing this more during the Q and A. Uh, Megan, you're muted. There it goes. That's better. Better? Thank you, guys. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. That was really fantastic. Um, our next speaker is Jan Schwelk, and he's going to be talking to us about resisting platformization, uh, critical roles, privileged position on twitch.tv. Yeah. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Jan. Thank you for the introduction. And today I will be talking about critical role, Twitch, and platformization. And just to a little bit, of, uh, I'm also a member of the Prague Game Production Studies Group at Charles University. So oh, let's get this started. Okay, so to just give you a brief outline of my talk today, I will start by introducing the concept of platformization. Then I will situate critical within the ecosystem of Twitch, and then I will move on to my empirical research, going over the over my methodology and two major themes that I think are the most important 
for our discussion today, and those are production practices and monetization. As a bit of self-promotion, uh, Convergence has recently published my article about critical role and D&D Beyond, and this uh, kind of draws from the same research project, but is it is a separate argument, so there's not much of, of an overlap here. So platformization generally refers to the process of how platforms shift uh, markets, infrastructures, and governance, but also change the practices of labor, creativity, and democracy. And for the talk today, I think the more important part of it is how platforms shape how cultural content is formatted and produced. So what kind of effect they have on the types of content that is created for those platforms and distributed through them. So Twitch is the leading uh, live streaming platform for video games in the West. Uh, and uh, thanks to the leak uh, from October 2021, uh, it was revealed that the highest earning channel was critical role. And this came a little bit of us as a surprise because otherwise the top ranks are uh, dominated by channels focused on video games and video game live streaming. Uh, so of course the success of critical role was well known by them, but it's a uh, dominant position on the platform was sort of a surprise. And it is also seen if we look at the other ranks, often uh, video game channels focusing on uh, games service titles like Fortnite, Apex Legends, League of Legends, and so on. So actual play show is a, definitely an outlier in that space. So uh, regarding my methodology, I've used the mixed methods approach. Uh, I've conducted a formal qualitative analysis of selected episodes. So for example, the uh, first episodes of new campaigns and also episodes that kind of cover uh, changes in the studio equipment and recording process. I've also uh, conducted a quantitative analysis of episode sponsorships, and this is up to date, so including last week's uh, Bell Cells episode 28. And I've also looked at uh, political economic aspects of critical role productions based on public statements of the company and uh, journalistic articles. And working on such a you know, popular show has also its benefits in terms of the fan labor and fan knowledge that is generated around the show. So it's very uh, fortunate to be able to work with projects like Critical Crit Role Stats and use those data to double check mine or kind of just do something that uh, a researcher on their own might be, might be a huge undertaking. So I just want to start by looking a little bit and recapping the broadcasting history of critical role, kind of situated with, within kind of the practices of, of Twitch as a platform and how uh, critical role kind of uh, worked within those constraints and uh, these expectations of how a show on Twitch should look like. So the first episode aired in March 2015 on the Geek and Sundry Twitch channel. So it was a weekly show, but Geek and Sundry had a lot of different programming so they could fill out the weekly schedule. Uh, thanks to the huge success of the show, uh, it became independent. It went independent in 2019, uh, establishing its own Twitch and YouTube channels to distribute the content and the episodes, but still staying, still focusing mostly on the one major episode a week. And it is perhaps no coincidence that the animated series that was successfully crowdfunded uh, premiered on Prime Video, uh, owned by the same uh, company as as Twitch. So if we look at the broadcasting practices, uh, the show started as a live broadcast, and it was also to set it apart from other shows from the Geek and Sundry uh, channel. So shows like Tabletop or Titan's Grave uh, that had more post-production uh, and looked different, and also allowed uh, the producers to kind of cut on some of the production costs, definitely related to post-production. Uh, however, the uh, live broadcast was switched to pre-recording due to the first major wave of pandemic in 2020, but it has stayed pre-recorded. So currently, even the, though the show still kind of broadcasts live in quotation marks on Twitch every Thursday Pacific, uh, uh, every Thursday night Pacific time, uh, those episodes are pre-recorded. Uh, 
So if we look at production practices, uh, previous research has shown how to which kind of encourages and often requires you know, long streaming hours to rise through the ranks of affiliate and partner, kind of these contractual relationships between individual creators and the platform. But as I have already kind of hinted at, Critical World was able to kind of bypass that by first being part of the uh, Geek and Sundry Twitch channel, and then when establishing its own channels, already having such a huge follower, such huge viewership and success that it can you know, st strictly go to being a premium partner, even kind of a rank above these uh, levels that are available to general audience or general users. However, kind of the rejection of uh, and these platform logics of Twitch weren't as pronounced in the beginning. So this is a screenshot from the first episode of Critical Role from March 2015. And here we can see that the visual presentation of the show was trying to emphasize the liveness, uh, the kind of the communal view viewer experience by also putting chat on, on the screen, um, bes besides being it also visible in, in Twitch. Kind of in the side side view. So, uh, but still the interaction between the players, uh, and the cast, and uh, and the audience was very much limited to maybe sorting out some technical issues. But uh, the cast kind of uh, maintained creative and authorial control of what was happening uh, in the game. So, cut to a more recent episode uh, from March twenty twenty two. You can immediately see uh, the, right, the increased production uh, costs, but other, otherwise the visual presentation is more or less the same aside from the discontinuation of, of chat being visible on the main screen. So even though the show is now being pre-recorded, it tries to stay without cuts aside from the halfway break that's uh, in each episode. So it kind of still has this sort of, as tries to at least emulate or uh, create this idea that it's still kind of played live in real time. So moving on to monetization, uh, uh, Mark Johnson and Jamie Woodcock uh, give a very nice overview of the different monetization options that are offered by Twitch. And while I don't have time to go over all these different uh, options, I want to point out that uh, critic role is mostly relying on three of these features subscriptions advertising advertisements and sponsorships and so this is also caused by the fact that uh, the visual presentation of critic role is much more clean much cleaner uh, in terms of you know the lack of on-screen notification and pop-ups that some other than many other live streaming channels on which are using to kind of engage and encourage different types of donations and cheering uh, during the during the broadcast. So, um, Critical Role explicitly encourages people to subscribe to to their Twitch channel. Uh, in uh, in the halfway breaks, there are usually ads that. Uh, sometimes jokingly in a humorous form, but always kind of, uh, kind of discuss the, the possibility and, and the perks of being a subscriber to Critical Role's Twitch channel. And I guess the biggest benefit of being a subscriber is having, the ex having an access to a VOD of, of a recently aired episode. I kind of put it into the context of the weekly broadcast schedule. As I've mentioned, uh, a new episode broadcasts on Thursday night, but uh, it is only uploaded to YouTube on Monday. So in between, if, if viewers don't catch the live broadcast or some of the rebroadcasts on Friday, uh, then you know, the only possibility to watch the show is with uh, an active Twitch subscription. So sponsorships are nothing uh, kind of unique to Critical Role, but Critical Role brings a lot of hobby-specific tabletop-related businesses to, to Twitch, such as D&D Beyond, Wormboot, Warboom Forge, Hitburn Press, and others. So these are advertisers and sponsors that otherwise are, wouldn't be so likely to appear on a platform dedicated to mostly video game live streaming. 
live streaming. But at the same time, uh, other businesses that are more at home at on Twitch also advertise on Critic Role's episodes, such as video game publishers, but also more generalist of digital businesses like NordVPN. So uh, what, what also sets uh, Critic Role apart from you know, video game live streaming is the ability to create a lot of merchandising products. And this is allowed by the fact that actual play and uh, kind of creates its own fictional worlds, its own characters, which are not limited by the copyright holder of the game system. Also thanks to the uh, how open gaming license and SRD uh, works and what it offers uh, players using uh, GND 5th edition. So this is just one of the examples of the many merchandising items that is offered by Critical Role. This one, a dice tray made in collaboration with Wormwood. But Critical Role also creates a lot of other merchandising products from miniatures to dice, apparel, and uh, others. What is also important, interesting to note is that, uh, for example, Alex Chalk uh, has noted that for smaller actual play channels, uh, merchandising is more of a matter of branding and visual identity of the show, but it doesn't really present a relevant source of revenue for your smaller actual play shows. But for Critical Role, based on the volume of the products created and the range of the products, we can uh, safely assume that this is a significant amount, a significant source of income for, for, for a huge popular show like Critical Role. And this is not only limited to merchandising products, collectibles of different sorts, but also to transmedia kind of narrative extensions of the fictional world as it is kind of played out on, on the Critical Role episodes. And this includes various uh, Diane novels, comic books, or the recent uh, animated series based on the first campaign of Critical Role. So uh, today I, try to kind of show some signs how critical role is resisting platformization and platform effects in how Twitch might be otherwise perceived to kind of format the culture products that are kind of distributed through its platform. So one of the most obvious differences is that uh, critical role is now broadcasting uh, pre-recorded weekly episodes. And this definitely goes against the live streaming kind of uh, nature and focus of Twitch. Also, it kind of operates more as a media company than, than a creator it can, and sidesteps a lot of the kind of boundaries that uh, uh, Twitch otherwise presents to more kind of emerging and aspiring creators using their platform, like multi-platform streaming that is not available to regular partners, for example. And also goes beyond sponsorships to create, uh, to merchandising, uh, offering uh, and creating a wealth of you know, uh, related time products that uh, the audience can uh, then purchase. And it's not then solely reliant on the income from the platform. So this all is kind of possible just largely due to the fact that kind of platforms afford these specific privileges to the successful channels. And this is something that Robin Kaplan or Tar and Tarleton Gillespie has called tiered governance in the context of, of YouTube. So uh, channels uh, that are successful don't really have to subscribe or follow these implied or sometimes explicit rules of how to operate on platforms because they are already have established strong position on the platform can negotiate better conditions and kind of have the ability to resist the platform logics. They can, and in case of critical role, this leads to the fact that critical role is in a way using Twitch as a sort of a temporary uh, repository for VOD uh, content between its you know free air date on Thursday night and its uh, publishing on YouTube on Monday. So yeah, thank you for your time. All right, thank you so much for that. Uh, our next paper is gonna be by Andre Zanesk 
Zanescu. I worked on that ahead of time. I'm not sure if I got it correct. So apologies. Um, please, please pronounce it for us again. Um, and he's going to be speaking about Magic the Gathering, Blockbuster Logics, and Resonance. Thanks. And yeah, that's going to be my presentation today. So I'm just going to get this started. Uh, I'm going to jump right in because we don't have a lot of time and there's a fair amount of ground to cover. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me all right. So I'm Andre. I'm a fifth year PhD candidate at Concordia University. Uh, I work with Dr. Mia Consalvo on things like Twitch streaming and gamification generally. But a lot of the work that I don't get to present my own is actually on uh, cultural representation and simulation in large scale games, so AAA games. And what I want to talk about today is where magic fits into that uh, and where it fits in relative to this idea of resonance that I'll go over and also blockbuster logics as they apply to card games. Uh, so uh, my project generally actually isn't only about analog games. Uh, so I compare games based on how they work through culture at large scale. Uh, and my two companies that I've been working a lot with are Ubisoft and uh, Wizards of the Coast. And I've been working on AC Origins and Odyssey on, on the one hand, and Magic in Amon Ket and Theros, which are its uh, sort of Greek and, uh, well, uh, Egyptian and Greek iterations over the last couple of years. So, uh, the questions that I'm generally asking is how do these culture, how do these games simulate culture and how can we use critical studies and semiotics frameworks inside of comms to study them? And more importantly, what does a built culture look like inside these games? Uh, you know, in terms of how it's built, how we, how each game structures them differently and also uh, what, uh, you know, unfortunate leftover, uh, stereotypes get used in these kinds of games uh, that come from a variety of media. One of the things that's come up over and over as I've been doing this research over the years is an idea of resonance, which is somewhat discussed in communication studies, but is actually way more applied in designing card games. Uh, and Magic especially has been discussing this idea very directly over the last couple of years but it's also present in a lot of other games as well under kind of different terminology. So resonance has sort of been discussed as this idea that uh, there's a congruence of the game content and the expectations of the player. So if a game is resonant, it's because it fits within the mold of what players think it would fit into. So if I'm playing a pirate game, does it look like the kind of pirates that I would think are pirates? And I, I use the I very liberally to, to talk about you know, the imagined audiences that these game companies are generally catering towards, which seems to indicate, based on economic stats, still a predominantly white, uh, able-bodied, middle-class, educated player uh, based on their own uh, sort of discussions about the topic and stats that they've been putting out over the last couple of years. Um, Mackenzie Wark has also discussed uh, theories of resonance as something like allegories of the world and Alexander Galloway's fidelity of context, right? So things match up, they resonate, right? Um, there are subtypes of resonance as well. So uh, for example, configurative resonance is the idea that players uh, make the game resonant in the way that they uh, use the rules. So this is very true for something like uh, Magic the Gathering, where you know you build a deck and the deck is supposed to sort of fit uh, an idea of what you want the game to be played like. But it also works in spaces like D&D, where you're building characters and you want to have a fantasy that works for you. Uh, it's also been discussed in terms of historical resonance as this idea that the culture being represented is sufficiently real, right? So it's not that the thing that you're looking at is completely accurate, but it's accurate enough for you to recognize it as the thing you think it is, right? And there are folks who've also been using this in terms of like educational design. So Klopfer uh, et al. and Shell have been using it to sort of teach younger players, uh, especially kids, uh, about social realities, which I think is the more positive aspect of this. But that's not how the industry tends to use this term. Uh, 
So back in 2016, Mark Rosewater, the head designer for Magic the Gathering, gave a uh, 20 Lessons in 20 Years of Magic talk that was really excellent, actually, and discusses his idea of resonance, right? And his idea is that humans uh, come preloaded with knowledge and feelings about the objects uh, that they're going to be manipulating and what's on them, and also that they have this pre-existing uh, sort of emotional equity in the culture that's being represented. So he he talks about, uh, you know, magic didn't invent zombies. They used a lot of zombie tropes that came from TV and movies to sort of make the cards work for players already. And he describes this as piggybacking, right? So using resonance that people already have to front load game information to make learning easier. Now, this makes a lot of sense for abstract concepts that are in Magic the Gathering, ideas like that a creature is flying or that it's fast. Those things kind of work. Or what does a forest look like? Where we start to get some issues is when these ideas about resonance and how to piggyback on them start to dovetail with cultural representations, and especially in the context of broader blockbuster games and franchises. So blockbusters, right? And I use that term uh, citing work by Charles Ackland, who's also a, a prof where I'm at. So the idea that the blockbuster is kind of the spectacle of bigness and that it's not necessarily a genre in the way that we think about action or horror or fantasy, it's really an industrial strategy about making things as maximally large as possible and constantly having new iterations, new technical cells, bigger, more expensive, and on the basis that they have to constantly be uh, getting more money out of the product that they're investing in, right? Uh, in terms of movies, and especially movies about Egypt, um, well, these things tend to line up very evidently for us. You know, movies like Gods of Egypt, Stargate back in 1993, The Mummy, or even Exodus, kind of all have a thing that we recognize stereotypically as, you know, Hollywood Egyptian-ness, right? Not the entire uh, representation of the entirety of the richness of the culture, or even made by the people who live there, but kind of the Western idea about it and how it's going to figure into our media products. And that is largely in part because of two things. One, Acklin's identified that blockbusters tend to be incredibly conservative as investment strategies. Nobody wants to rock the boat. Nobody wants to make new things if you can still make money off of the old thing. And the idea also is, well, we tend to self-insert uh, avatars for ourselves into these experiences as a way to relate, right? So the idea is that uh, it's a lot harder to identify with something that's not you, uh, that requires a lot of empathetic work and a lot of learning and a lot of challenging presuppositions about the thing that you're looking at. However, if you just draw it into your own experience, well, it becomes a lot easier to make sense of things. So movies like The Mummy, right? they're seen from the perspective of British American uh, people who are going to despoil tombs and are sort of confronted by the otherness of what's traditionally Egyptian, right? Or has already been framed as Egyptian by centuries of colonialism. Now, this is not new to these movies, right? Uh, it goes back to movies like Karloff's Mummy from 1932 or even Cleopatra. Uh, and they're a long genre, right? And so what happens is as blockbusters are, remain conservative and we tend to move outside the box less and less, they become even more sedimented, right? So you get, you never get anything about this culture, for example, outside of classical antiquity, primarily because that's what people recognize as Egyptian. Uh, Derek Johnson has described this as franchise logics or the idea that you're going to create synergy and that you can keep making more and more money off of populating every media possible with the same representations over and over. Now, given this idea of blockbuster logics and franchise logics compared with resonance, what I've been talking a lot about in my work is this idea of articulated resonance, right? So the idea that uh, media makers are using resonance strategically uh, and sort of configuring it for users based on what they expect users to already believe, which you can imagine is fairly limiting. Uh, and Magic certainly qualifies as a blockbuster franchise, right? So since 1993, celebrating Magic 30 uh, this October, 
uh, now has over 140 sets, 22,000 unique cards, and has been going through cultures, uh, churning through them since 1993. So things like Islamic Golden Age Arabia, Japan, India, Scandinavia, Ancient Egypt, Archaic Greece. And I didn't put it on here, but Art Deco New York in the newest expansion is also part of this. It's been listed by Hasbro as one of its top brand performers, earning a combined $1 billion with uh, Dungeons and Dragons for 2021. It's unclear which one's the dominant one. I would imagine it's D&D, but still the company listed as one of its two top earners. And then uh, Jan has also discussed uh, magic mediatization increasing around forming an esports scene and sort of marketing the product even more to incoming players. Now, the set I'm using as my example today is one instance, but really you could do a mirror version of this talk for almost every cultural setting that magic has gone through. So I'm talking about Amonkhet, right? This is their Egypt set that they made in 2017. And the way they talk about how they made it is very interesting, right? So they have a, uh, the game design lead was somebody who had spent five uh, years in Egypt and they consider that sufficient knowledge about the culture to sort of start making the game. And what they did was a series of internal brainstorming rounds where they asked people, well, what is it that you think is Egyptian? And they said things like gods and pyramids and tombs and mummies. And so that's what we get in the game, right? And uh, they chose this set based on player demand, but there wasn't uh, like a focus tested external uh, grouping of players or consultants to kind of come in and, and do this kind of work which is already a problem in itself. Uh, and we should be thinking about this in the larger circuits of colonial exploitation and global cultural flows, stuff that Arjun Apadurai has talked about as you know, media being shaped by economic, uh, tech, cultural, and ideological dim dimensions to produce the object. Uh, ideas of cultural hybridity. So the, the fact that stereotypes are kind of used to make cultures more malleable to us as Westerners. And the idea that, you know, the stereotype is a metaphor for exploring the space of colonialism that's not accessible to us anymore, right? So if I can't go exploit uh, culture, I might as well like buy into a game that can do that for me or that, you know, is supposedly a victimless crime. Um, again, I use the I collectively, not hopefully not me. Uh, and this is a much older tradition, right? It's not, I don't mean to be, you know, hammering on Magic the Gathering specifically because they're just the one of the newer versions of a very old uh, paradigm, right? Um, movies like Stargate uh, did this, Magic does this, Assassin's Creed does this. And on the bottom right, this is the Temple of Dender at the Metropolitan Me uh, Museum in New York that, you know, literally excavated a temple from Egypt with UNESCO and re-established it on New York soil for you know, dubious cultural preservation regions, uh, reasons, but that's kind of where we sit now. And so that that's sort of the, the backing for the kind of work that I've been doing with Magic, which is, you know, analyzing the cards, working through them to kind of go back and figure out what the tropes are, what they gesture to, and especially what older traditions of colonialism they fit into. Uh, and this means working at the micro scale, uh, which is inherently, uh, you know, maybe consider tedious work. Uh, I work from uh, Mia Consalvo, Nathan Dutton's uh, game analysis toolkit, also work done by Nathan Altus that's published in the uh, uh, Analog Game Studies Journal and work from my master's thesis and work that's currently under review. So the idea is really simple. You take a card, you look at it and you log every aspect of it. You know, uh, the card frame or the format, the art that's on it, the name, the cost, uh, typing and tags, keywords, rules text and flavor text, and all numeric parameters. And you do this for every card that's in a set. So 269 cards. Um, but you pay attention to things that are called horizontal and vertical cycles because you're trying to establish patterns. And this leads you to start making uh, very uh, incomprehensible giant grid graphs like this, which are really about establishing patterns across a full set of magic, right? And so this is what internally is referred to as horizontal and vertical cycles. So horizontal cycles are sort of concepts across all the colors of magic. Vertical cycles are themes inside of a color. So for example, uh, the first row on the left, uh, or the column, I guess, is the god cards in the set. And so you can see that 
they kind of all look the same. You don't have to really pay attention to the parameters right now, but they structure a concept across magic. And you keep doing this until you run out of cycles to do. And this set specifically also had one about monuments. Uh, and so the idea of bricklaying or architecture is present in the game as something that's essential to put in, even though it's not, uh, it doesn't fit into the color paradigm of magic. And once you're done with this, you end up with what Bernhard Siegert is called a grid, right? It's basically what they use to structure resonance as a device of inclusion and exclusion, right? You include things that you perceive as Egyptian and you exclude things that you don't perceive that way. And unfortunately, this tends to dovetail with pre-existing uh, stereotypes that you assume your audience to have, right? And so as magic continues to do this across multiple sets, the tech for doing this uh, becomes sort of a franchise mechanic unto itself. Uh, but also if you tend to return to the same set, you're gonna reproduce a lot of the same stereotypes. So this set had a second block, Arrow of Devastation, produces a lot of the same logics. And this tends to happen for every set of magic that we can look at. So my working conclusion for now is really that articulated resonance is a sort of jury rigged, very ad hoc form of resonance, but it panders to what players already expect uh, or know. And this is based on, on maker perceptions, not actually on what players know. It's kind of what the game makers think that they know. Uh, it's also applied and intensified to kind of stoke blockbuster logics and franchise logics. And I, I would expect that to be the case, given that Mark Rosewater is, like many of us here, a communications uh, studies scholar who ended up going into industry. And also that it reproduces uh, and strengthens stereotypes from hegemonic discourses and ideology that are in society. Uh, that's going to be it. I think I went slightly over, but. I'm happy to take questions after. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, our final paper is going to be by Adriana Burton and Maria Alberto. Uh, Adriana is from the University of California, Irvine, and Maria is from the University of Utah. And they're going to be speaking to us about the critical role of fame in gaming charity. Uh, and then uh, after this, we will have our Q&A. So if you want to uh, begin to type questions into that Q&A box, then we will get to those after this paper. So take it away. All right, so thank you so much for the intro, uh, Megan. As uh, she mentioned, uh, my name is Maria K. Alberto, and I'm a PhD candidate in English at the University of Utah, working with Ann Jamison on canons and popular culture text, including Critical Role and D&D. And I'm Adriana Burton, a second year PhD student at the University of California, Irvine in the Department of Informatics. Uh, I'm in the Critical Approaches to the Technical and Social Lab under Aaron Jamel and Bo Rupert. And we're here today to talk about the relationships between tabletop role-playing games, uh, TRPGs, and charitable giving. At this point, we also have to give a shout out here to Jan and his talk on platformization, which did such a fantastic job of introducing Critical Role, its origins, and its timeline to date. That was amazing, so thank you. And this is because that to make our own argument about this, we use as a case study critical role as well, but specifically the 2020 creation of the Critical Role Foundation, or CRF. While far from the first or only example of game makers and creators soliciting an audience's support for charitable endeavors, we find that Critical Role and the CRF offer a particularly clear demonstration of how TRPGs can leverage particular ludic, ethical, and emotional sensibilities to motivate charitable giving. In Critical Role's case, this includes leveraging their show's tremendous visibility and mobilizing their specific ethos of don't forget to love each other. Slightly uh, redundant at this point, but still worth saying, which is that uh, the name Critical Role will likely be familiar to anyone who's playing, watching, or working on tabletop role playings at this point, and honestly, for the last couple of years. Um, as most of us seem to be familiar with, the show markets itself as a bunch of nerdy ass voice actors playing Dungeons and Dragons, and it is one of the biggest DD uh, actual play shows, or what Shelley Jones has defined as a live streaming or recording of people playing role playing games to be consumed by other others in the form of videos and or podcasts, stressing an audience beyond those who are actually playing the game. 
At present in 2022, Critical Role enjoys a self-reported half a million viewers per week with synchronous Twitch streams on Thursday nights and several hundred thousand more with rebroadcasts on Fridays and YouTube uploads on Mondays. Critical Role also brings in an estimated 5 million USD in annual streaming revenue, a number that does not even include unspecified merchandise sales, industry sponsorships, and partnerships with corporations such as Amazon and Wizards of the Coast. And as they've continued to grow, Critical Role has also continued to expand its endeavors beyond uh, just the show. Most of these are commercial, such as their publishing arm, Darrington Press, and everything put out through the press, um, as well as the partnerships just mentioned above, but not all of them. In 2020, they announced the creation of their own 501c3 nonprofit, the Critical Role Foundation. As of June 2022, the Critical Role Foundation website reports seven partner organizations, as shown here. Taken together, these organizations paint the picture of Critical Role supporting causes in the U.S. and globally, and investing in partners who make material impacts in their constituents' lives. Yet the cast's own interests and connections are also still visible to savvy viewers. OSD, or Operation Supply Drop, is a veteran support organization most vocally supported by former military kid and CR cast member Travis Willingham, while Shanti Bobbins, director of operations Ajit George, is a fellow D&D content creator working on D&D's Radiant Citadel and Ravenloft. In longer versions of this project, we delve into such affective ties more deeply than we have space to do today. Um, so what we're going to focus on for this talk is how the Critical Role Foundation brings together and builds upon a number of concepts that are not normally discussed together, including uh, game-related giving, celebrity philanthropy, and fan activism. The end result of combining these three things is a form of ludic participation that seems unique to tabletop role-playing games, and possibly even to actual play shows of tabletop role-playing games. Fundraiser Jeff Brooks articulated his approach to fundraising thus in 2014. The advanced fundraiser doesn't seek shocking. The advanced fundraiser seeks connection. And we argue, tabletop role-playing game-driven fundraising, such as the Critical Role Foundation, can offer a unique cocktail of different means to create such connection. In a 2020 interview with The Verge, Critical Role cast member and now Critical Role Foundation president um, Ashley Johnson reported that it was partially the response from fans over the years to fundraising events that helped the Critical Role team decide to launch their own foundation. Apparently, Johnson was continuously blown away by how well their various charity streams went. Prior to the creation of the Critical Role Foundation, Critical Role had been involved with charitable giving in multiple other ways. These included fundraising efforts during their time with Geek and Sundry since 2015, as well as more informal crowdfunding and signal boosting efforts. But the Critical Role Foundation changes these paradigms. For instance, that same coverage from The Verge also reports that the Critical Role team's hope is that both their fans and also people who may not follow the team as closely will be able to donate throughout the year, treating it like a marathon, not a race. One advantage that Critical Role has over other traditional entertainment companies is that because the various cast members feel so accessible online, their new charity initiative is in the charity initiative is coming from a team that people already know. Being transparent online with fans about how important charity work is to them will hopefully keep things going strong. Um, again, according to the foundation's new CEO, Ashley Johnson. Leveraging both growing brand visibility and increasingly familiar ludic conventions, the Critical Role Foundation also banks on there being significant existing investment in the Critical Role cast as celebrities and their ethos of don't forget to love each other. Beyond their relatability, humor, and fame, Critical Role's financial success relies upon its community's shared beliefs, a different type of connection than what even Brooks, the season fundraiser, had in mind as more of best case scenarios. Particularly unique to Critical Role is its status as a TRPG show. So we find the ludic incentives for giving immensely vital in this case, particularly in more recent cases such as the 2022 Red Nose Day featuring Stephen Colbert, Critical Role relies upon pre-existing viewer connections by centering new storylines of beloved characters in an existing story world. To demonstrate Critical Role's strengths in this new and growing area, we now turn to an overview of three strands of critical thought that we find intertwined and in influencing this, games and giving, celebrity philanthropy, and fan activism. 
So gaming has a long history of giving, a lot of connections between these two areas. Standards for giving include industry donations, gaming charities and events, and individual charity streams. So after a brief overview of these three categories or types, we then dive into the particularities of charity in the TRPG space, and then demonstrate how critical role has significantly diverged from these existing avenues with the Critical Role Foundation. The gaming industry as a whole donates regularly. According to the National Philanthropic Trust, U.S. corporate giving reached 21 billion USD in 2021, while industry names such as Blizzard and Epic Games have reportedly donated up to 12 million USD to specific charities. And outside of industry and giving through that avenue, gamers also originate events that can even turn into their own charity organizations. Gamers and fans have organized events like GuardCon, or Games Done Quick, GDQ. Uh, the latter began in 2010 as a charity marathon during MAGFest 8 and is now uh, twice yearly, week long, 24 hour, say that three times fast, um, video game speed running marathon. Um, GDQ tends to raise over 1.5 million USD per year um, with two semi annual events one that's held in January to benefit the Prevent Can Cancer Foundation, and the other that's held usually late June or early July that benefits doctors without borders. Lastly, and very prevalently, are individual charity streams planned and held by highly visible streamers of their own volition. Charity streams are common across all genres of streaming, gaming related or otherwise. One notable example is H Bomber Guy's 57 hour Donkey Kong 64 stream, which raised over 340,000 USD for the UK trans organization Mermaids. The stream featured celebrities like Doom co-creator John Romero and US Democratic Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. While this is one of the most popular examples Examples, countless streamers host regular charity streams. And while many of these charities do not necessarily exclude TRPGs, the TRPG space often functions quite differently from what are traditionally video game spaces. And Jan already gave us a bit of a shout out there showing how Critical Role was standing out from all the other top results in that leak. Um, so comparable giving initiatives that are specific to the TRPG space include Role versus Evil, tabletop nights, game for the cause, and D&D Beyond charity streams. Just as a brief note about this, of these examples, D&D Beyond arguably comes closest to what we're seeing with the Critical Role Foundation. However, a central part of our argument here is that Critical Role is its own unique media text in ways that D&D platform, D&D uh, Beyond as a platform just is not. The Critical Role Foundation, however, combines all three of these types of gaming charity as an industry creator, an official charity organization, and a collective of individual celebrities. We suggest that the Critical Role Foundation's success is due to the combination of these three types of charity present in games and due to their addition of two more strands in the existing schema, celebrity philanthropy and fan activism. So we will be discussing these at more length in a longer version of this project, but we want to briefly overview them here. Celebrity philanthropy describes how celebrities use their public visibility, brand credibility, and personal wealth to promote not-for-credit uh, profit organizations. And some different forms of this include endorsements of other existing organizations, appearances or products that promote existing charities, and founding their own charities. Entertainment media stars. Sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> She's losing it. Okay. <laughs> Entertainment media stars, sports stars, and corporate actors such as billionaires are among the most prominent examples, and such celebrities often find ongoing opportunities for identity construction offered by charity activity, which can deflect attention from personal industry scandal, individual wealth, poor performances, and other issues. And yet all of this changes in a time when what constitutes celebrity, scare quotes and air quotes, is likewise changing. Most notably, the critical role cast are not entertainment media stars right up there with like television or Hollywood actors. And yet they've been featured in Forbes, Variety and Entertainment Weekly um, recently, as well as like coming up in prominent industry events like San Diego Comic-Con. And their voice acting work does feature in major, major industry products anime voiceovers, animation, video games, beyond critical role. Um, likewise, the literature on this topic has documented many valid and important critiques of the entire concept of celebrity philanthropy, which again, we discuss further at a later date. 
To complement this, fan activism occurs where fanish engagement with a fictional text translates into an organized set of politicized actions. So earlier discussions of fan activism often referred to examples such as fans protesting the whitewashing of central characters in M. Night Shyamalan's uh, 2010 live action Avatar The Last Airbender. However, more recent definitions such as Ashley Hink's um, instead stress more public engagement that emerges from some commitment to a fan object, which also describes a wider variety of civic and political actions than earlier versions had. Hink also outlines four ethical modalities or means of framing connections between fanish affect and civic engagement. For her, these are connecting, expanding, retelling, and exhibiting absence slash absent pairings. So of Hink's four options, we find her first one, connecting meanings, most prevalent with the Critical Role Foundation. Hink describes this option or modality as a means of connecting values or finding parallels and links between the fan object and relevant civic goals. So far, we have described how Critical Role leverages game-related giving, celebrity philanthropy, and fan activism to create a unique style of charity. Within the latter two categories, we see immense room for exploration. In a more wordy, if possible, version of this presentation, <laughs> we particularly investigate the ways in which tabletop role-playing games' specific ludic connections encourage immense giving, such as giving fans agency to choose the adventure for a celebrity, as shown with Red Nose Day 2022, and the appeal of further developing an existing story world. In successfully linking relatively niche fame, and again, just comparing the TRPG space with television and Hollywood, um, successfully linking that type of fame with six-figure charity results, the Critical Role Foundation suggests a new standard of moral ethos and charitable endeavors for TRPG companies, and we argue, potentially, the gaming industry at large. And as briefly demonstrated here, we find that Critical Role and the Critical Role Foundation offer a particularly clear demonstration of how TRPGs can leverage particular ludic, ethical, and emotional sensibilities to motivate this kind of charitable giving. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. You can find our Twitter handles here on this very Mimi references slide. <laughs> this is also like the encapsulation of like our mental states at this point um, in the summer. Um, thank you also to the Tabletop Research and Practice Collective, a growing group of tabletop researchers. This wouldn't be possible without their support. Um, you can catch Brandon's talk in the next panel we hear and PB's tomorrow at 2 p.m. And Hibby remains the wind beneath our wings, even when they're not presenting here today. So. Thank you so much for listening. And Megan, hack to you. <laughs> that was phenomenal. Uh, so thank you so much to all four of our panelists. Um, I'm gonna begin with uh, the questions that are here in the Q&A. Um, so please continue to, to add those in as we go. Um, so the first question we have is for Jack. Um, so Myron asks, the MTGA economy is a bit similar to the way that digital media content platforms enable stricter control of digital copyright. Think Netflix, Kindle books, et cetera. Do you know if Wizards of the Coast views its cards as published intellectual property content to which fair use and so on applies? Uh, so that's an interesting question. Um, I, uh, can't say for sure um, to like what degree they view it as as content, um, but I do know like they hold copyrights on um, on their cards, and uh, my sense is that they're generally like kind of reluctant to uh, to enforce that. Um, uh, so like for card proxies and alters, and uh, or like using them in uh, like YouTube videos or whatever, um, I haven't like been aware of like any active like takedowns or or anything um and so that gives like the like custom proxies market this kind of like weird like black market uh vibe where it's like acknowledged but like not necessarily sanctioned um and the only way that um it really gets cracked down it, uh, on in paper magic um as far as i'm aware is that uh like you you can't use these in like officially sanctioned um events um However, there are other things that they will do to protect their copyright. So like um, earlier this year, or maybe it was last year, um, I don't know, all the time is running together. Um, <laughs> there was the uh, MTG uh, or Magic the Gathering uh, DAO project, which is like a uh, like crypto NFT thing. Um, yeah. And that got shut down on the basis of copyright, um, uh, you know, 
um, I, I don't remember all the details, but basically they wanted to create a like ledger of like who owns uh, cards and whatnot, um, and like use that for all sorts of things. And wizards um, said, "You're not allowed to do this. Um, we don't want any like NFT nonsense." And part of that is, uh, and I've, I've ta- I talked about this um, bef- uh, in like other places, but part of this is like related to backlash, uh, like community backlash on like NFT stuff. Um, but also as I kind of gesture to in my talk is like, they don't need NFTs to like make money off their thing, especially in a digital sense. They've already like got it figured out. Um, and so like, they don't want something like that, um, that would allow people to cash out of the like kind of digital, uh, digital ecosystem. Uh, right. Like they don't want your cards to be able to migrate from platform to platform, right? Like they want you to be an MTGA. <laughs> For sure, and they've also been a li- uh, somewhat aggressive on like uh, purchasing um, like community-made platforms for playing online. So, like at the beginning of the pandemic, um, uh, Spell Table was a like c- uh, community tool for like playing Magic online. It was basically just uh, like a way to connect um, a web app where you could point your webcam and then play with your uh, paper cards. And by the end of the year that had been purchased by, um, by wizards. Mm. Um, and, uh, but there's also, um, things like, uh, um, cockatrice and, uh, I forget. There's a whole bunch of them where like, it's, it's like, you can play magic online, but it's, um, very like rudimentary and not as streamlined as a lot of the like first party, um, systems, but they also like just let those exist because, um, uh, like it, people, these people are still like, I, I, you know, no research to back this up, but I assume most of the people using these platforms also play magic in a physical capacity. Um, and so as long as they're like, people are engaging with their product, um, it's not as huge of a deal. Mm. All right, thank you so much. Um, This next question is addressed to Andre. It's from Adrian. Um, They ask, one could argue that in Dungeons and Dragons slash tabletop role-playing games, stereotypes somewhat serve a purpose of creating a shared fantasy space. It seems that Magic the Gathering does not rely on this for its mechanics. What do you think about this difference? And does this mean the stereotypes in Magic the Gathering sets serve for mostly marketing re- reasons as opposed to mechanical ones? So I'd start by saying that they, all of them serve marketing purposes, whether they're mechanical or, or, or merely cosmetic. Um, I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but for example, in an earlier version of this slideshow, um, the example given was for the embalm mechanic, which is the mechanic that Amonkhet has as like the their quintessential Egyptian one. The problem isn't so much that they're creating a shared fantasy space because magic has uh, sets that are less cultural that do this as well. So like their home uh, set of Dominaria tends to work on more uh, soft, malleable fantasy tropes that are you know around us everywhere. Uh, in the cultural sets, what happens though, it's what's really interesting is in sets like Theros, that's Greek, it tends to actually be so default magic that they have trouble distinguishing it from other sets. Whereas in the more, you know, quote unquote, exoticized locales, they rely on stereotypes that are problematic. And so the question isn't, for example, you know, does a monkette have stereotypes? It's why doesn't it have things that, you know, Egyptian consultants might claim are more important to them than the ones that are present in classical Hollywood film, right? So for example, um, I don't know, something like a mechanic based on the Nile River, which they had considered for their Greek set based on the river Styx. That wasn't really something that we get to see when it's something that's an othered culture, I suppose. Thank you. Uh, This next question is a little broader. So it's addressed to Jan and maybe Maria and Adriana. And so I'm just going to say, if this resonates with anyone on our panel, feel free to to jump in. Um, So the question is from Brian and uh, they ask, while the conclusion was that Critical Role resists platformization by Twitch, 
Could we conversely say that Critical Role itself has become a platform for the production of an array of content, commodities, and experiences? Thinking here of the Critical Role spinoff, D&D setting books, board games, and other products that invite open-ended or narrative engagements with Critical Role as a world or a setting. That's a good question. <laughs> I'm happy to let Jan speak first since this was for you, but I definitely have thoughts on this that I'd love to get back to. Yeah, please go first if, you, if you'd like to. Um, so the brief answer, Brian, is that yes. <laughs> so um, this is actually what I'm currently working on a dissertation chapter on because I do make a, a very similar argument that a lot of those paratexts from Critical Role are complicating this kind of space because so much of what you find the the move from the original Taldori campaign setting to Taldori campaign setting reborn is incredible. It's it's very interesting to look at what they have changed, what they've trying to sweep under the rug, what they actually have the cast going on social media and saying, oh no, this was never canon, or oh no, this was the faulty narrator of the first uh, iteration of this text, and it doesn't so much follow for the second. Um, but yes, I, I can see um, Critical Role itself becoming more of that that kind of platform-like appendage from which these build. So again, just very excited to see you asking that. Yeah, I can maybe add, I think it's like, the, like if we look at the grand literature on platformization, I think like they would maybe say that it's getting more closer to like a traditional media company because it has this, built this rich transmedia world. But I would say also that with the involvement of fan artists, I think it's kind of serves this, like it allows for the collaboration and participation of fans more than, you know, the regular media companies would allow. So they have much closer relationships. And I think like your amazing talk about the Critical Role Foundation kind of also illuminates that, that like these collaborations and participations are much more kind of in the DNA of the show. So uh, I would say that, like these platform like, uh, extensions of critical role are definitely a thing that you know also should be studied and explored. Something that really strikes me about um, your thoughts there, Jan, is that how many of their fan artists have they hired and brought on an official capacity to create like the art for Taldori campaign setting reborn or for their campaign art. Um, they also had their new copyright document that they released in the last several months and every time um, specifically Travis Willingham, who is the CEO of Critical Role Productions, every time he talks about that I keep seeing him adding, this is a living document or ter terms like that, kind of stressing that this document is not meant to create divides between critical role and it's like art creating fans who've played such a major part in making it the success that it is. So that has been really interesting to watch as well. Awesome. Uh, we have one question left and then we are going to take our break. So this is from Danielle. Uh, and she asks, Adriana and Maria, in your research, have you looked into the recent successful charitable TTRPG bundles on itch.io? So things like TTRPG for reproductive rights, bundle for Ukraine, bundle for racial justice, et cetera. And how might those movements either fit in with or diverge from the frameworks you discussed in your talk? Yeah, I'm so happy to see this question. <laughs> Something we thought about bringing into our slides when we had all those examples. I'm like, no, it's just it's too much to handle um, because they do fit really well into that that very specific TRPG space, but they also diverge in really interesting ways. Um, so we see like they're very familiar to critical way, critical role in the way that they market. Like they're really relying on affective ties and an ethical framework. But unlike Critical Role, they don't rely on celebrity at all. Like this is very much platform based. This is itch promoting this kind of material and then other people in networks individually promoting. Um, so we, we absolutely like, I want to get into it, but unfortunately doing Critical Role and doing these bundles are a whole different kind of sphere. Um, but they are operating at two very similar and kind of like new levels. And I think traditional charity organizations are doing. Awesome. Well, this panel was phenomenal. So thank you to everybody, uh, all of our panelists for 
sharing your awesome research with us. And thank you for every, to everyone who was attending. Um, please continue the conversation in the Discord. Um, one thing I thought was really great, uh, last year's Discord, the, the conversation kept going for days and days afterwards. So, so please you know, keep chatting and keep sharing there. Uh, so we're gonna take a, about a 40 minute break. And when we return, we will have, it'll be 4 p.m. Eastern and we will have our panel on race at the table. So thank you everybody, have a good break.